Hello, I am Dr. James Wharton of the Dikidoku Project. The Dikidoku Project is based around a series of puzzle games that you can use to take part in the science of quantum error correction. This video is on a series that present the ways that we scientists use to solve similar problems to this, so that you can take our secrets and improve on us. Uh, usually, we are explicitly telling you about methods that you could use in your own playing of the game. Today, it's going to be more of a history lesson into the discovery and usage of one of our favorite methods, which is uh, based on the graph theoretical problem of minimum weight perfect matching and uses an algorithm known as Blossom, which might sound a little bit dry at the moment, but let's, let's soldier on and see if it's all right. Um, now, first we're gonna consider one of the great masterpieces that was published in 2002. It is, of course, not Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix because that came out in 2003. It is instead uh, the great and seminal topological quantum memory by Eric Dennis, Alexei Kataev, Andrew Landau, and John Preskill. Now, don't be fooled by the alphabetical order of the authors here. A lot of the great stuff in this paper come from the brain of Andrew Landau. I mean, this Alexei Kataev bloke, I don't even know why he's on here. He's never done anything in his life. All he's ever done is create the, the codes that modern quantum computation is based on and on which the uh, game Dikidoku is also based. So, pff, who's he, eh? So, uh, actually, he is quite important. Uh, John Preskill is also quite important. I'm going to tell a, a, a anecdote about John Preskill now. So, forward uh, about 30 seconds to a minute if you want to get back to the interesting stuff. I was once at a conference. John Preskill was giving a talk, and everyone from miles around, packed in to hear the great John Preskill. I was giving a talk right after John Preskill. There wasn't even a break or anything. As soon as he finished, I was to get up and start doing my talk. So all of the people were packed in for John's talk. He finished, and there was a mass exodus. I said to him, well, you're obviously more popular than I am. I was just a PhD student at the time. He was already the great John Preskill, so this was uh, um, something obvious to anybody. But he nevertheless looked at the mass exodus with genuine confusion and said, I'm sure they're just going for coffee. And he genuinely seemed to believe that. So he seems to be quite a cool guy. I haven't met him all that much, but that's John Preskill for you. That's my anecdote. I haven't met Eric Dennis because he went off out of science and into earning money. <laughs> These people, eh? But uh, yeah, Andrew Landau, he's also a cool guy. And he told me a few things about how he came to find out about minimum weight perfect matching and the Blossom algorithm and present them in this paper that is uh, one of the great papers of uh, in the history of quantum error correction. In the game Dikidoku, there's a version which you can only get online which has ones and you have to look for groups that add up to a multiple of two. The numbers are typically quite close to each other, so here will be one group, here is another, and this might fool you because you think that these should pair up, but actually, if you did that, then this one would be lost in a load, and so would that one, so let's pair those up and those up. And if you get the pairing so wrong that there's a guy over here and a guy over here that belong to the same pair, then um, that's when you would lose in the game Dikidoku. So this is the version that we're thinking about when we think about uh, minimum weight perfect matching because uh, matching is a problem in graph theory uh, which I'll explain to you in a very short way so what is a graph in graph theory it's a bunch of points with lines between them a matching is basically just a pair of points which have a line between them and a perfect matching is a set of pairs in which every dot is involved in a pair so this isn't a perfect matching uh, but this is so um, a minimum weight perfect matching is when you assign a weight to each of these pairs and then you try and find the set of pairs for which adding all of those weights up gives you the smallest number possible. So for example, uh, if you had a dating site, you might, uh, for all of your people, come up with a number which describes how compatible you think they are. And then you would try and find pairs so that the amount of compatibleness is as good as possible 
and uh, you would use something like minimum weight perfect matching for that. Although actually, because I just phrased it there as compatibleness, you would want to find a maximum weight matching. If your number measured incompatibleness, then you would want to find a minimum weight uh, perfect matching. So this is the minimization problem. And the trouble with minimization problems like this is they're often quite difficult to, for computers to chew on. As you increase the number of clients, the amount of time your computer will have to spend doing it often goes up, say, exponentially. But a nice thing about minimum weight perfect matching is that there has been discovered a method which can do it much more quickly than that. A lot more quickly so that we call it computationally efficient. And that is called the Blossom algorithm, which was uh, invented by Jack Edmonds in 1961. So all we have to do is implement this Blossom algorithm and we can solve this minimization problem. And that's awesome. And this is important to us because, of course, we want to find pairings. We want to come up with some number which describes how likely these are to be part of the same pair and then find the pairing which is most likely. So the, the number we could use is the number of errors it would take for these two to actually be the same group. If there was one error here, it would create these two. So that's a distance of one between them, but you would need three between these two and so on and so forth. So what we're finding is a, a minimum distance matching or a minimum number of errors to make this happen matching so that we get the most likely set of errors that could have caused these things. So one day at the end of the 90s, Andrew Landau was at a conference in the city of Turin and he went for a, a hike along the River Po. Let's uh, take a hike along the River Po now then. Um, unfortunately, we're getting out of where my internet has loaded nice uh, high resolution so maybe here when the resolution got low instead of looking at the uh, the surroundings he got to talking and he was with a guy called Peter Hoyer I might have mispronounced that because it's one of those O's with a line through and um, he was bemoaning the fact that he had to do error correction for uh, exactly this problem and that solving this minimization problem would be awesome, but it's too hard, so oh, I have to do it a, ru a rubbish way. Uh, and this Peter Hoyer guy was a computer scientist, and computer scientists know things uh, beyond the ken of us mere physicists. And he told Andrew that indeed there was an efficient method, the Blossom algorithm, that could help him. So Andrew rushed back to uh, civilization to go on a computer, his smartphone was suffering from a lack of existence at the time and he confirmed that this algorithm did indeed exist and just what he needed uh, to do his quantum error correction and it's also something that we find in this great paper uh, topological quantum memories and uh, also its relation to statistical mechanics models oh, it's just a great paper you should read it anyway let's talk about a bit more about why uh, minimum weight perfect matching is useful. Let's say this is a very simple example of um, the problems we're looking at. We've got a bunch of ones. We have to pair them up. How do we do this? Well, this is an example in which you might be able to see just from looking at it that these should probably pair up, these should pair up, and then it should be these pairing up and these pairing up. But this is the most likely answer exactly what we just said here with the pairs being flagged up in different colors but if you had a greedy algorithm it might see these two next to each other and pair them up so a greedy algorithm is not one that looks globally at the whole but one that just looks locally and says ah oh, yeah that's good enough pairs them up and um, then you're a bit messed up because this one is about as far away from this one as it is from that one this one is about as far away from this one as it is from that one. So they are just dangling about everywhere trying to find someone to pair up with. And that is pretty dangerous when you're doing quantum error correction or playing Dikidoku. So uh, how could you correct your mistakes? Well, let's say you, you just thought that these should go together. You didn't actually do something which was irreversible. Then what you could do is just carry on with the rest of the the pairing so let's pair these up and then maybe we'll pair these up we'll pair these up we'll pair these up and then our goal to check if this is a good decision is to find a loop so here this is a bit of string going between there and there 
and then let's put another bit of string going somewhere else so that's this uh, light blue here and then this connects there to there so next now connect up the dangling corners dangling ends by putting that to that and now we've got a loop which goes alternately between these pairings that we've already decided on and then these other pairings that we uh, just had to add in to make the loop and we could look at these two sets of pairings they're both equally valid pairings of these four numbers and we can see how many errors would have had to happen for the ones to have been created like this so here there would have been one error happened there maybe two between there so that's uh, three for the light blue for the purple there would have to be one there and then four all the way from this one to this one to match up those two so that's five for them that's more errors it's less likely because errors are quite quite rare and so we see that the light blue ones are better so we just throw away what we initially had and replace them with these light blue ones so looking at some of these loops is a way that we can um, reverse our decisions that we accidentally made because we were thinking too locally and instead think a bit more globally um, so this is something that you could think about when you're playing Dikidoku of course normal Dikidoku is based on multiples of 10 rather than multiples of 2 so it's not just uh, pairing up but you can start to think about how you can try and uh, test the decisions you've made and try to make them a little bit more global rather than local. So here's a picture of Mario and I will leave you with that. Thanks for watching and thanks to Andrew Landau for participating.